Privit and greetings from my hometown of Gollum here in the center in Air Square. Give you a little bit of a 360 to start off. And today is day 76 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's the day after May 9th, which is Victory Day. It has been traditionally celebrated in the former Soviet Union. It is a day to celebrate uh, the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany in World War II. Well, Great Patriotic War is the way it's described normally because uh, the Soviet Union started the war in 1941 when they got invaded. They kind of forget the two years beforehand, 1939, 1941, when they were actually allied with Nazi Germany and invaded places like Poland and the Baltic countries. But anyways, that's probably a topic for another video. But I was really struck yesterday when I watched the parade in Moscow on Red Square and the speech by Vladimir Putin and just the dramatic difference both visually and in terms of content with that speech and the one made by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky that he released from Reshadik, the main street through the center of Kiev. And I think it's really interesting just to take a little bit of a analysis in terms of the different styles that they presented and how they are waging their representative, the representative, this war from obviously opposing sides, because it tells you a lot about the societies that they are representing at the moment. So let's get into the video. Also at the very end, I'll highlight some of the absolutely vile cynicism on the part of Vladimir Putin, which came out after he made his speech that probably a lot of people missed. Anyways, let's get into the video. Bye, Italy. Tsar experience. So I'm gonna start with Putin's speech on Red Square. Let's go into a few parts of it. Uh, that are relevant to understanding how the war is going. Now, there have been a lot of speculation beforehand in the media that he was going to make some big announcement, like maybe full mobilization, maybe declare a formal declaration of war, as opposed to a de facto one, which was his speech two days before this war started. Um, and that would be necessary, apparently, under the Russian constitution in order to mobilize uh, more people, basically put a lot of conscripts into the army. But none of that happened. It was a bit of a dump script from uh, that happening, but he did say, um, anyways, let's just look at it, you'll, you'll understand. I'm going to put a link down below to both speeches so you can go watch the whole thing. I'll just pull out a few pertinent points. Trying to create this unified land corridor from Crimea through to Donbass. Mariupol is right, is right there in the middle of it. So they've got to control Mariupol in order to be able to say they've got this uninterrupted land corridor. So first you can see just a lot of pomp and ceremony around it. You got Red Square, very historical and beautiful part of Moscow. And then you've got all these troops lined up. I saw somewhere else, can't remember the guy's name, the YouTuber, but he said there was like 11,000 uh, Russian soldiers there in the square lined up. And actually the first, well, he also pointed out, I think it's Bo is his name, that visually you should just think that Russia has almost certainly lost significantly more troops than those 11,000 on the square. Just think of the human cost already uh, on the Russian side. So let's see how um, how Putin tries to, in a way, justify it. I know it's, a, it's also primarily supposed to be a speech around, about what happened in 1945, but of course, with the current war against Ukraine, these things get merged together. Esteemed citizens of Russia, dear veterans, Soldiers and sailors, sergeants and petty officers, ensigns and warrant officers. So it kind of starts with this very verbose, long introduction to everybody who's supposed to be there. It's very much like kind of old-fashioned, right? It's, a, it's not very modern in terms of his uh, direct communication, especially because now uh, we all have cell phones, we're all used to you know, receiving information straight away and having, well, I guess, a lot more, less formal communication. Um, but he's very much into the pomp and ceremony. It's like something from another, another century, almost. Just before I get into the meat of it, like, uh, also, there was a lot of speculation about Putin's health. So a lot of observers were really surprised about how healthy he looked and energetic, considering the expectation was pretty low. I mean, you had a video clip of him uh, a few weeks ago, I guess at this stage with Shoigu, the defense minister, where he was basically grabbing onto the table all the time, or his hand on the table. So uh, I guess people were surprised he looked so healthy, but I mean, he's there flanked by all these um, 
basically primarily old dudes in military uniform. That's the backdrop. Uh, there aren't so many young people, uh, except for the soldiers standing there, obviously. You know, as I said, more than that number have already been killed so far in the war. Tragic. They fought on the Borodino field. They fought outside Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, and Minsk, Stalingrad, and Kursk, Sevastopol, and Kharkiv. It's the same now. In these days, you're fighting for our people in Donbass, for the security of our motherland, Russia. So there he outlines what happened in the 1940s, nearly 1940s, where during Operation Barbarossa, Nazi Germany, uh, they had been allied together, Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, then Germany invaded uh, the Soviet Union and basically, including the territories they just annexed in, uh, in agreement with Germany from 1939 to 1941. And, you know, it had this heroic defense within the Soviet Union, uh, at certain hero cities, so he lists a few of them there, and also then when the Soviet, Soviet Union later retook that, they had to fight their way back into those cities. And suddenly he jumps to the present day and talks about uh, basically fighting for defense of the motherland in Donbass. I mean, it's a pretty illogical jump in the sense that, well, Russia just invaded uh, a bit like in 1939 when the Soviet Union invaded Poland might be a better analogy. Plus, there isn't really any emotional language. It's a very, um, very formulaic, uh, not very much, you know, emotive description in it. Uh, and just for me, I mean, I'll deal at the end of maybe how people who support Rush, R Russia's invasion might interpret it. But so far, uh, yeah, pretty illogical jump between the two. In December last year, we proposed to make a treaty of non-security guarantees. Russia called for a search for uncompromised solutions. So then he starts off on this long list, this litany of excuses as to why Russia's in Ukraine. Oh, Russia's always the victim. So he starts off with, oh, we saw, we saw the solution. Yeah, Ukraine just wouldn't surrender and give in to all our demands. Um, basically rehashing a lot of what he said in his, what I call his declaration of war speech from two days before the war. A large part of it, actually the part that he mainly dealt with in the latter part of that speech, he actually leaves out the part at the beginning, which was his main justification in Castle's belly for invading Ukraine. If you um, put a link up above on a card down below in the description uh, to, that, to my reaction to that speech, uh, which was basically he outlined that he doesn't believe that Ukraine has a right to be independent of Russia's sphere of influence, and secondly, that its borders are illegitimate. That's basically the imperial uh, reasoning behind the invasion, but he's left that out in this speech completely. Obviously doesn't fit very well <laughs> with um, May 9th uh, and Victory Day. But that was in vain. NATO countries didn't want to hear us. Oh, no one wanted to hear Russia. This means that in reality, they had quite different plans. And we saw that. They were openly preparing another punitive operation in Donbass to an aggression against our historical lands, including Crimea. So there he basically tries to present his invasion as a preemptive or preventive war to stop Ukraine taking back um, the territory that Russia currently occupies or before February 24th occupied either by proxy with these so-called separatists. I mean, that whole distinction has kind of disappeared anyway with this war and Russia's uh, 2014 illegal annexation of Crimea. So we're talking about basically he's trying to claim that the territory that Russia occupied prior to February 24th, so Crimea and those parts of Donbass, are Russian historical lands. Uh, I guess that's the way he's trying to describe it. Well, he actually said Donbass is the historical lands and then Crimea, he's trying to claim, is in, I guess, Russia. Yeah, well, that's all illegal under international law. Whether you agree with Russia, uh, Crimea been annexed or not, it's just not legal. So again, he's, he's trying to basically say, well, they were going to invade it. And he said openly, but yeah. I mean, if you go back to that speech he made two days before the war, this is <laughs> rubbish. There were calls in uh, Kiev about the possible acquisition of nuclear weapons. Then he's trying to say they were getting nuclear weapons. Well, they should have been getting nuclear weapons because in 1994, under the Budapest Memorandum, Ukraine, Kazakhstan and Belarus gave up their nuclear weapons. Now, I know they didn't control them really and they were just on their territory, but basically they gave it up in return for a security guarantee. And one of the, uh, the guarantors was Russia and they had to respect their territorial integrity. So obviously Russia just ignored its uh, obligations under that particular uh, international treaty. Uh, in addition to the fact that it was illegal under international law anyways. So, um, yeah. And 
yeah, I just move on. The NATO alliance began to move into their troops into our neighboring territories, and they were creating an, an unacceptable threat to us right at our borders. So there he's claiming that they were threatening Russia. I'm relying on the simultaneous translation here. It might not be the best uh, for what he actually said. Everything pointed to the fact that uh, uh, clash with neo-Nazis and Banderavites, on whose uh, the United States and uh, their minions uh, staked, was inevitable. And then he says it was inevitable because there were these Banderites, these neo-Nazis, he's trying to describe, backed by the West. We had to do it. It's not her fault. Um, so yeah, he's not really taking ownership or responsibility for what's going on. He's basically just blaming everything else, everyone else, and saying that we had no choice. Obviously, they had a choice, so this is pretty weak from my point of view. Uh, but again, at the end, I'll get to how it might appeal differently to his target demographic. We saw them unfolding a military infrastructures, how uh, hundreds of military advisors began to work, and how regular supplies were being made of weapons. The danger grew every day. So there he's giving out about the fact that the West was arming Ukraine. Actually, not really that much compared to now, but they have been. Uh, as if Ukraine doesn't have a right to defend itself against Russian aggression. Uh, basically, you know, most of these uh, excuses he given very similar to the Cassus Belli given by Nazi Germany uh, when they invaded Poland in 939 as well. So what's interesting there is like he's not declaring any sort of victory in the war that's now, when he says this is day 75, it's now day 76 when I'm filming this, um, because there hasn't been any victory. Uh, on day 76, when I look at it, basically Russia has taken Kherson, Novokovka for the water supply to Crimea. They have almost taken all of Mariupol to create the line bridge fully down to Crimea from Russia proper. Uh, there are de jure borders. And uh, yeah, they made some gains uh, in um, around Donbass and you know Luhansk, Donetsk. Haven't taken all of that yet. And they've been pushed back out of Her Kharkiv Oblast. Also, um, a little bit down in the south. So they don't really have that much to celebrate, especially because in day 20 of this war, they control a lot more territory in uh, Ukraine than they do now. So yeah, it's just basically a litany of excuses for the train wreck that is Russia's war so far. And I say train wreck when you look at how little they've gained for how much they've had to expend on it in terms of human lives. Remember, it's definitely more than that one in terms of killed in action than the soldiers lining up in Red Square. It's absolutely insane. It reminds them out of how weakened its army's been by the expenditure of its materiel, plus the sanctions. Uh, I think now the latest estimates are that the economy will attract by, uh, was it more than 15% this year? And uh, Russia's become a prior with the West. I know it's not a prior worldwide yet, but you know, plus they have the specter of war crimes hanging over them as well. So all this to capture Kherson. And um, it's not sure they're going to hold any of this territory anyway, either. So let's move on and um, just jump to another few bits before I get into Zelensky and do your contrast. The United States of America, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, began to talk about its exclusivity. And they accumulated with that not just the whole world, but their satellites as well, who now have to pretend that they don't notice anything and swallow everything patiently. But we are a different country. So here he tries to distinguish Russia under his rule with the West. Russia has a different character. We will never give up our love for our motherland from our faith and our traditional values and the traditions of our ancestors. What I find interesting about this is trying to contrast uh, Russia under, under him, under Putin, with the West. He says they were going to focus on their traditional values as opposed to being modern. So it's kind of a very atavistic um, speech to I think to appear to old people that Russia should just stick like things were in the past. But what is the traditional values that he's promoting? Are they, um, you know, he's also referred to religion and faith. So something from the 19th century, or is he talking about the authoritarianism and totalitarianism of the 20th century um, that he's pushing the country towards? And um, yeah, just the whole visual with an old man like Putin surrounded by I guess primarily old men or old people in general anyways, <clears throat> with all the military behind him. Talking about how he's, uh, the reason, you know, one of the reasons to stay with him is to have the way things were bef in the old times. Uh, it's just kind of a geriatric uh, speech, right? I mean, in terms of um, 
what it seems to be appealing to. But I can also understand that that's going to appeal to maybe also uh, those who are supporting Russia outside to a large extent, those who are disenchanted with the West, who are from the West, right? So they say traditional values, they're basically anti-modernism, whether, you know, I mean, that's your right to be against uh, modernity and whatnot and want to, at least in democracy, you have that right. Not really in, in the kind of state that Russia is. You don't get that freedom of speech if you don't agree with the state's line as much. Yeah, I can see why, that would have, that, why he put that in. He's trying to uh, create a justification why he's in power because, you know, the Russian economy hasn't done well for more or less the last decade. It, you know, a lot of it's to do with sanctions um, since 2014 uh, because, well, that was the consequence of his first uh, foreign adventures into Ukraine by annexing Crimea. Yeah, now the quality of life of Russians probably is going to decrease. They're going to have less opportunities to travel. The economy is going to suck even more. Uh, their, their own freedoms uh, at home have been reduced as Russia goes from authoritarianism towards totalitarianism. So his justification, it seems to be, let's defend traditional values. And um, yeah, it's um, what he's setting himself up in terms of worldview as being different. And I'm going to contrast that with Zelensky uh, in a minute. Let's go on and do one final clip with Putin. We bow our heads to the memory of the martyrs of Odessa who were burnt alive in the trade union building in May 19, 2014, to the memory of uh, women and old people and children in Donbass who died in the under the shelling of Nazis. We bow our heads to our comrades in arms who fell in the righteous battle for Russia. So there he tries to make a connection between the sacrifices in World War II fighting Nazi Germany with Russia's fight since 2014 in Ukraine by basically calling the Ukrainians all Nazis. They, all, it's, it's pretty like vile actually what he's doing because he just launched a war in, in part in Donbass, obviously, in other parts of Ukraine as well. But in Donbass in particular, Mariupol is in Donbass. And I was there before the war about six months ago. It was actually seen, I always like to say, seen like now. Here, let me just show you. Oh, you know, there was like parks, pretty similar. There was actually a park here. Here you can see the square and there's people out you know, enjoying the sunshine and, um, you know, just going around their normal weekend, pushing prams uh, with young children, all that kind of stuff. And they have raised the city. It's like something from medieval times. They basically obliterated most of it. And that's what they're even showing off because, you know, they show their own drone footage to the Russians where there's almost no building, just one church in the center. Almost every other building looks destroyed. And on top of that, you had these, um, Chechen fighters who they had there with this kind of medieval back, uh, backdrop with the f buildings on fire and they're celebrating having destroyed the city. I mean, this is what he's done. And then he's crying these crocodile tears in his speech about the old people, women and children of Donbass that he alleges the Nazis killed between 2014 and 2022. Like, I have no, no idea and no, I haven't seen a good calculation for uh, how many civilians have died in the sacking of Mariupol alone? Never, never mind the other places like Volnyovaka, which they also completely obliterated. But it's going to be multiples, maybe 10 times as much as you know, the number of civilians who were killed by both sides in the war between 2014 and, and 2022 in Donbass. And the fact that he cites that when he's doing something that's probably in a multiple of 10 in terms of destruction, maybe it's even going to be more, 50 times more by the end of this war. It's just like so disingenuous and pretty revolting. And then he refers to in Odessa that there was a, a fire um, back in 2014 where about, about four, 40 pro-Russian activists died, but it's pretty unclear as to really who's at fault for that. Eh, I watched the videos myself at the time. And, uh, you know, if you take away the title, always blaming the Ukrainians, it's just not really clear. Maybe they, they were killed uh, because the Ukrainians killed them, but it's not really clear. It looked more like an accident than anything else to me. But anyways, if you tot all that up, it's just like a fraction of the destruction and murder that this Russian president has done himself in those areas that Russian speakers live. That's the most perverse and disgusting part of this. Anyways, I'm going to come back to that at the end. So let me sum up uh, Putin's speech. Lots of pomp and ceremony, obviously Red Square, beautiful place, but very uh, staid, I would say, um, no real emotional language, no real connection between 
you know, the events in 1945 and what's happening in Ukraine today that's coherent. I mean, he makes it kind of a, a very lame justification, a connection between them with the Nazis, but it's not very convincing, right? I mean, basically, what are the soldiers that he's speaking to really fighting for there? He's tried to claim that they're fighting the Nazis and their historical lands, but in reality, he's fighting those poor guys and women who are in front of him are going to go and possibly die in an imperialistic war for his ego and his grandeur. Yeah, it's very backward looking. It's full of excuses. There's no real plan been outlined. No victory to celebrate in the modern, you know, obviously in 2022. And I think, you know, he's, the analogies that could be made are more with the Soviet Union's invasion of Poland in 1939 when they were allied to Nazi Germany than really the victory to uh, liberate um, cities like Kiev or Odessa or Sevastopol. Sevastopol in Crimea uh, from the Nazis. Yeah, I mean, that's my reaction to it, but I can see that it will appear to what I call the Babushka Brigade. So it's kind of like the old uh, pensioners who sit at home, uh, you know, they don't get out much anymore because they're older and they just consume state TV all day and they think that there's all these Nazis walking around Ukraine, goose-stepping, sig-hiling through the center, searching for Russian speakers to murder and crucify on crosses and all this madness that's been built up on Russian state propaganda over the years, because that, he's basically just reinforcing that propaganda narrative throughout his speech. And for those people, yeah, they will say, oh yeah, that's why we're there and that's why all our people are, I mean, they, they don't even acknowledge that <laughs> so many Russians, young Russians have been sent to die there. And, you know, obviously older people, they tend to look back at their, their youth in particular to roast tinted glasses. Uh, so for a lot of those people it would have been the Soviet Union. And uh, that was one thing that they had is that they defeated the Nazis in 1945 was something to be proud of. Russia was a superpower, not Russia, but Soviet Union was a superpower. Obviously Russia is the successor state under international law to Russia. Uh, so I can see what I would appeal to them. But for younger Russians, and looking at this, unless they've also bought into that narrative of the propaganda from the state, why they're in Ukraine, it must be horrible to watch and just think, this guy basically surrounded by old people and cheered on by the babushke, uh, basically want to drag us back, you know, to at least, <laughs> you know, Stalin's era. Yeah, it's just not very, it wouldn't be very inspiring to me, but I could see that for, and who knows how many people support the war, it's hard to get it, real figures, but probably a majority. I'd like to think it wasn't, but that's what we probably estimated for. I'll, I'll circle back to, at the end of the video, to what he did after his speech. But let's go and look at Zelensky now. Великі народи великої України. 24 серпня 2021 року усією Україною ми відзначали 30-річчя нашої незалежності. So first of all, you can see that he's um, walking through the center of Kiev. He makes some references to their parade that I guess was on Ukrainian Independence Day, maybe. Um, a few months earlier where they had their military parade, a bit similar to what you saw in Red Square. But again, look at him. He's not, I mean, Putin was in this suit that didn't really sit comfortably on him. Maybe he had some bulletproof vest underneath or something like that. Uh, but he's walking Zelensky through. It's more dynamic and he's referring to the independence of the country. 24 лютого ми зрозуміли цю істину, коли удаваний друг розпочав проти України війну. Це війна не двох армій, це війна двох світоглядів. So there he's talking about it's not a war between two armies, it's a war between two worldviews. That really resonates with me because that's what we saw. You saw this world from Putin before he's kind of making excuses for his imperialistic, what in reality is his imperialistic war in Ukraine. You know, he's defending an old way to be, right? It's, he's surrounded by old people. Uh, he wanted to go back, you know, to maybe the 19th century in terms of uh, imperialism. He's made other speeches or answer questions with foreign media where he's basically alluded to so much in history from the 19th century. It seems to be the area that he wants to live in. And you contrast that with, say, uh, what Ukraine has been trying to do, at least since 2014, since they took this turn after the Euromaidan revolution towards trying to join Western institutions, clamp down on corruption, being more open to the world. Yeah, joining, rejoining uh, Europe in effect. And I've seen that myself, having lived in Ukraine, the progress has been made since 2014. Вона їх дратує, вона їм чужа, вона їх лякає, вона полягає в тому, що ми вільні люди, які йдуть своїм шляхом. І на цьому шляху сьогодні ми ведемо війну і нікому не віддамо ані клаптика своєї землі. So there you can see he's also of course dressed in military fatigues because he's a, um, a president 
in a country that's been invaded. And there he's, he's outlining that they're not going to concede a one single piece of land. I mean, it's just like easier for Zelensky in this situation to make a convincing comparison with Victory Day and the defeat over Nazi Germany, if we look at it from 1941 to 45, because, well, the Soviet Union got invaded by uh, Nazi Germany. So Zelensky can make these analogies a lot easier between the defense of an invaded nation like the Soviet Union was in 1941 and Ukraine today because Ukraine is also invaded. Putin can't make those convincing analogies because, well, it's an imperialistic war by Russia. Today we acknowledge the day of victory over Nazism and we don't know the tactic of our history. We are ashamed of our descendants які разом з іншими народами у складі антигітлеровської коаліції перемогли нацизм. And there is able to tie that into defeating Nazism before and I guess you know the analogy is quite clear with the Russian state today that maybe it's calling it a Nazi state would be going a bit too far but a fascist state it's a revanchist autocracy that's invaded its neighbor in a war an imperialistic war so uh, very strong uh, the visuals were his dynamic uh, he's walking through the center of Kiev, a city that Russia would have liked to have walked through themselves uh, on May 9th, but they got to walk through a small part of Mariupol instead. And we don't want to annex it to Nazism. And there he's able to tie in this whole Russian propaganda narrative of denazifying Ukraine with the millions of Ukrainians who died fighting Nazism in the 1940s. So all very strong. Uh, his speeches are very well written um, and he's very good at um, tying in emotional language and visuals uh, in general. Also they have the music behind it. So um, yeah, very compelling piece so far. Let's just Fast forward to a few other things. You can watch the rest of it. I'll put it down below. We пережили різні війни, але всі мали один фінал. Нашу землю засівали кулі і снаряди, але жоден ворог не зміг пустити тут коріння. Нашими полями їздили ворожі колісниці і танки, але це нікому не принесло плодів. They're a very, very figurative language when he's talking about tanks and they don't bear fruit and sowing the fields. It's very, I think, generally, generally. Um, relatable as well on a human level. So yeah, very, very strong speech so far in terms of the emotional language. Whether you agree with Ukraine or Russia in the war, I think you have to agree that this speech is a lot more powerful than what we saw from Putin so far uh, in terms of the language and the, the kind of metaphors that he's using. Хоч орда, хоч нацизм, хоч суміш першого і другого, яку представляє нинішній ворог, ми перемагаємо, бо це наша земля. Бо хтось воює за батюшку царя, and there he ties in like the defensive fight for the homeland the, and contrasting that with your morale basically with fighting for the Führer or the Tsar which is referring to you know tying in um, Nazi Germany and the Führer uh, out of Hitler and the Tsar which is basically a reference to Vladimir Putin, that it's never going to be as strong as when you're fighting from your homeland. So again, very, very nicely tied in the historical narrative of uh, this being Victory Day and the defeat of the Nazis by the Soviet Union with Ukraine's current struggle. We don't say we can repeat it, because we want to repeat it. 2194 days of war can only be able to Повторює сьогодні жахливі злочини гітлеровського режиму. Наслідує нацистську філософію, копіює все, що робили вони. Він приречений, бо проклятий мільйонами предків, коли почав наслідувати їхнього вбивцю. А тому втратить все. І зовсім скоро в Україні буде два дні перемоги. And there he starts to give a very definitive plan for when they've won. There will be two victory days in Ukraine. Obviously not just uh, celebrating the future sacrifice made by uh, Ukrainians during the Soviet Union in def defeating Nazi Germany, but also once they've won a victory day, celebrating the sacrifices by the current Ukrainian nation uh, in overcoming Russian invasion and fascism. Перемогли тоді, переможемо і зараз. І Хрещатик побачить парад перемоги. Перемоги України. З днем перемоги над нацизмом. Слава Україні! So they are just really well tied in emotionally, 
with the sacrifices and victory of the past, with the current struggle and with the future of victory. So very inspiring. And of course, in ter I mean, he's a former actor, so delivered quite well, very emotionally and just figurative language, very relatable, it's dynamic, he's moving about, he's uh, in his military fatigue. So definitely, uh, I think a really amazing speech. And you contrast that with Putin, it's very staid, it's all this pomp and ceremony, and there's, there's just excuses during it, very weak tying between uh, the past struggle over the Nazis and the current war. Well, it's just hard to do because, well, yeah, it's, it's just not really the same thing. It's uh, more like 1939 to 1941, as I said. I want to just end this video by contrasting how Putin finished his, I guess, um, day of celebration with the pomp and ceremony, as I said, in Red, on Red Square in Moscow. Well, what he actually did, what his forces did later that that evening, so last night. So he goes and he lays a single red rose in front of the memorials uh, for each of the hero cities in the Soviet Union. So they would have been cities that were called hero cities afterwards uh, because they had put up heroic resistance to Operation Barbarossa and the Nazi invasion. And several of those cities are in Ukraine. So obviously you've got the capital of Kiev, you've got Odessa, you've got also uh, Sevastopol, Sevastopol, and uh, I guess there's some other, I think maybe is Kerch there. But anyways, the ones that were the most pertinent uh, were Kiev and Odessa because, well, they're still under Ukrainian control and they have been attacked during this war by Vladimir Putin's forces on his orders. And you know, when he was, he was there in front of each of the um, little memorials about to put the rose down and it's all very dignified, he kind of, and he went to put them on Kiev and Odessa. I just got this eerie feeling looking at him. I really thought like he looks like a mobster at a funeral of kind of a rival um, how would you say, not capo, but like godfather figure of family, uh, head of a family that he had knocked off or something. And then he goes to pay his respects disingenuously at the, uh, at the funeral, just on, you know, probably from The Sopranos or some other mobster film, Sicilian mobster film. Because he's there putting a rose down, especially on Odessa, right? He puts that rose. Remember, Odessa is a Russian-speaking city. It was founded by Catherine the Great, Empress uh, Tsarina Catherine the Great. The lingua franca of the city is, is Russian. He's there claiming that he's defending Russian speakers in historical lands, right? He goes and he puts that rose, uh, supposedly, to honor those in the hero city of Odessa in the Second World War when they fought against Nazism. And what does he do that evening? Ой, 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 сейчас будет волна. Russian forces bomb Odessa. They blow up uh, in addition to other parts of the city, and they've been doing this for you know since the war began. They blow up a shopping center. A shopping center I've been to, it's in the north of the city called Riviera. A shopping center, and they destroy it, completely obliterate it. I mean before. You know, it was just about two weeks ago, they were firing precision guided missiles into residential areas. You know, if this happened in Paris or in London or New York, we just call it terrorism. Imagine ISIS did that. They blew up a shopping center and it was at night and uh, a couple of people were killed. It fortunately wasn't in Saturday in the middle of the day and killing thousands. But at the same time, think of the goal and the absolute chutzpah of this revolting individual. He goes there and he puts a rose on the memorial of Odessa and then he goes and he bombs it. He basically went and spat on the honor of Odessaites who fought against Nazi Germany. He went and he spat on their memory. He is a revolting, disgusting, old man. Old Stary Dedushka. Absolutely deplorable. And that, for me, summed up the difference between how Russia is led and Ukraine is led. You got one old, disgusting old man, old little mobster, at the end of his life, spitting on the honor and glory of 
the generations before. And then obviously in Ukraine, you've got a young dynamic leader who wants to lead them somewhere, defend the nation and lead them on a better path for the future. So I think it's sad also for young Russians uh, who don't agree with the war. I know there are lots of them, uh, even if I've been disappointed overall by the reaction of Russia to this war and the lack of protests and opposition. I know it's not uh, a free society in order to protest, but yeah, it must be really depressing to watch that and know that this is the person, the individual leading your country. So yeah, that's the, the clear dichotomy between the two choices, between uh, a country that's looking to the past, that's engaged in a war of imperial um, expansion, that's committing vile war crimes and at the same time spitting on the memory, desecrating the memory of a heroic generation in Odessa, a Russian-speaking historical city uh, in the south of Ukraine versus the younger, more modern, forward-looking, dynamic uh, Ukrainian president who's fighting a war of defense and survival of his young state that wants to rejoin Europe and have a more optimistic and positive future for its people. That's the choice, the clear dichotomy between the two, and it's laid out to you there in the two speeches and the visual styles. Anyways, that's my video for today. Drop a comment down below. Slava Ukraini, my thoughts with everybody who's still in Odessa Mama uh, and other parts of Ukraine under a constant attack from the thuggish Russian regime. Dopobachna, desvedanya. See you in the next video. Sar Experience.